morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Thank you, worship team. You know that one song that we sang, Jesus, 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 just that name. In my devotions, I'm going through the book of Acts. And of all the times I've read through the Bible in the book of Acts, I never realized how many times it refers to the name of Jesus and all the things that were done in the name of Jesus. So one day, hopefully soon, I'm going to put together a message, taking the book of Acts, just dealing with the name of Jesus. There's just something about that name. And after all, it's all about him anyway. Before we we can go to the word of God, let's just bow in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege, the opportunity we have of being in your house this morning. Thank you that we can come to you and worship you through music, through the giving of our tithes and offerings, through the proclamation of your word. And we acknowledge that you and you alone are God. And beside you there is none other. And so, in the ways in which we can, sometimes I feel they're so inadequate, but we do worship you and honor you and glorify you and exalt you. And we do so in the name, this of every name, that name by which one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. We come to that name, Jesus. And we thank you for who you are, for all that you are, for all you have done, are doing, will do. Now we commit to you these next moments and pray for your direction. I pray that you would once again open our eyes to see and behold wondrous things from your word. Open our ears that we would hear your still small voice. And open our hearts that we receive from you what you have for us. Speak, minister, accomplish your will. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. As I have been praying and looking to the Lord for what to share this morning, I've been thinking about what's happening in our world. And of course, we've been focusing on COVID and now the Delta variant. And it seems to me as though there is just a tremendous fear that is gripping the hearts of people all around the world. But especially here in America. A fear that seems to me is paralyzing a lot of people in how they live their daily lives. I think of what I have been hearing recently due to the social distancing and, and all of that, how the physical abuse in homes has risen. Drug use has risen. Suicide and attempted suicide has risen. And as I began to think about all of that, it hit me. We have a lot of people that are living in defeat. And I want to focus on that this morning. A one-legged school teacher from Scotland offered himself for service in China. With only one leg, why do you think going as a missionary? asked his friend. I do not see people with two legs going, replied the one-legged candidate for missionary service. He was accepted. So he defeated, so he suffered defeat 
I wonder if you're like physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. Listen, there is hope. There is no reason in the world for you to remain downtrodden, defeated, discouraged, listless, feel like you're useless. Feel like you have nothing to offer. And I would like to suggest three steps that I believe we can take in our Christian walk to raise ourselves up out of that sense of defeat and despair that we may find ourselves dealing with this morning, or if not, maybe in your future. How can we overcome all that the world is bombarding us with? All the negativity, all the criticism, all the fear, that sense of despair and hopelessness and helplessness. How do we overcome all of that? Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I believe we can come away with three steps that we can take with God's help to overcome this living in defeat or the possibility of living in defeat. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Reading from the NIV, we find the following. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David's men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the son of Nabal of Carmel. David was very distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abithar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me Ephah. Abithar brought it to him, and David inquired the Lord, should I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor Ravine, where some stayed behind, for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine. But David and 400 men continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, To whom do you belong? Where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, a slave of the Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Gev of the Carathites and the territory belonging to Judah and the Gev of Cana, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, Can you lead me down to the raiding party? He answered, Swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were, scattered with countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling, because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. They recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plug or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, This is David's plunder. Then David came to the other men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Besor Ravine. They came out to meet David and the people with him. As David and his men approached, he greeted them. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us, handed over to us the forces that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? <clears throat> the share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made us a statue, an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. 
when David arrived in Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, Here is a present for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth Negev, and Jadar, to those in Aror, Sifmoth, Eshtimoah, and Rachel, to those in the towns of the Jeremiahs and the Kenites, to those in Hormah, Boreshin, Ephek, and Hebron, and to those in all other places where David and his men had roamed. Quite a story. I suppose if anyone had a sense of living in despair and defeat, it could have been David and his men. When they find out that everything they had, including their families, everything has been gone, taken from them. And it got to the point where they were so despairing, so discouraged, so frustrated, that it says they talked of stoning David. And so I want to suggest to us this morning that step number one in overcoming the sense of defeat, the sense of despair, is to focus on the Father. Focus on the Father. Look at verse 6 once again. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because his sons and daughters. But David found strength in whom? The Lord his God. Verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. And then down to verse 23. David replied, No, my brothers, you must not do that which what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed over to us the forces that came against us. You see, step number one is focus on the Father. Regardless of the circumstances, Churchill said this, success isn't final. Failure isn't fatal. It's courage that counts. You see, you don't just Focus on your success or your failure. You keep plotting on. Be strong and courageous, it says in Joshua. Paul J. Meyer said, 90% of all those who fail in life are not actually defeated. They simply quit. They give up. They are in so much despair. It's like, why continue on? William Marston said this, It isn't defeat that makes you fail. It is your own refusal to see in defeat the guide and incentive to success. It isn't defeat that makes you fail. It is your own refusal to see and defeat to guide and send to success. And I believe that as we focus on the Father, that is going to make all the difference in the world. I don't know about you, but look what's going around me. It can be very frustrating, very discouraging. It's like, is there really any hope for this world? But we know there is. It's found in Jesus. And so if I want to overcome all that is coming my way, I just need to keep my focus on my Heavenly Father. Amen. It was mentioned when in Sunday school. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in life His glory and grace. Where is our focus this morning? I trust it's on the Father. You see, these men with David were feeling sorry for themselves. Didn't know what to do. They could only focus on their immediate loss. They lost sight of the larger picture. They were really down. And I believe that when we are down or at our worst, God can step in if we let Him and begin to mend us, minister to us, and through us, and make us into what He wants us to be. But you see, 
we have to turn to the Father. Helen Steiner Rice put it this way in a poem that she wrote entitled, Look on the Sunny Side. There are always two sides, the good and the bad, the dark and the light, the sad and the glad. But looking back over the good and the bad, we're aware of the number of good things we've had. And in counting our blessings, we find when we're through, we've no reason at all to complain or be blue. So thank God for good things He's already done, and be grateful to Him for the battles you've won. And know that the same God who helped you before is ready and willing to help you once more. Then with faith in your heart, reach out for God's hand, accept what He sends, though you can't understand. For our Father in Heaven always knows what is best, and if you trust in His wisdom, your life will be blessed. For always remember that whatever betides you, you're never alone. For God is beside you. Focus on the Father. Step number two is focus on the facts. Focus on the facts. And we find this in verses 8 through 10. Look there very quickly with me. Once again, in verse 8, And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this great party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Beast of Ravine, where some stayed behind. For 200 men took exhausted to cross the ravine, but David and 400 men continued the pursuit. You see, they were focusing on the truth of the Word of God. God said, pursue them, I'll give you victory. And so they acted on that. We need to focus on the Father, but focus on the facts, the truths of God's Word. Solomon said this in Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Remember, the name of Emerson said this, A man is what he thinks about all day long. And William James said this, The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Focus on the facts or the truth. Listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to focus on the facts or the truths of the word that we find in the word of God. All of the truths, the facts found in the Word of God. For instance, don't turn there, but just focus. If you're taking notes, you can jot down 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are we saved through faith, and then of ourselves, and be to God, not of works, so that should boast. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing that he who began to work in you will continue to perform and perfect the work so that Christ comes again. And then in verse 13. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Verse 19. But my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful as he called you, who also will do it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse from all righteousness. Chapter 4, verse 4 of 1 John as well. Greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your worship, by your technology, and He will do what? Make your path straight. Isaiah 26, 3, he will keep a perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. We go on and on and on. The truths of the word of God, the promises of God, the facts that we find in the word of God. These are just a few of them. Believe you me, when you focus on the facts, it makes everything look so different. Because it reminds us again that it's all about our Heavenly Father. Whether we realize that He is in control of everything. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it's that way. But we know that God is sovereign. He is in control. Helen Steiner Rice also penned these words. 
Count your gains and not your losses. As we travel down life's busy road, complaining of our heavy load, we often think God's been unfair and gave us much more than our share of little daily irritations and disappointing tribulations. We are discontented with our lot and all the bad breaks that we got. We count our losses, not our gain, and remember our tears and pain. The good things we forget completely when God looked down and blessed us sweetly. Our troubles fill every thought. We dwell upon lost goals we sought and wrapped up in our own despair and wrapped up in our own despair, our defeat. We have no time to see or share. Another's load that far outweighs other problems and dismays. And so we walk with head held low and little do we guess or know that so many of us on life's street is burdened deeply with defeat. But if we but forget our care and stop in sympathy to share the burden that a brother carried, our mind and heart would be less airy, and we would feel our load was small. In fact, we carried no load at all. Focus on the Father. Focus on the facts. And number three, focus on the future. We find that in verse 25. Interesting, very short verse, and, and sometimes we overlook the shorter verses, the simple statements that are there. But in verse 25, it says this, after all that has happened, after David focused on the Father, focused on the facts, the truth that God had promised victory, that they would overcome. Then we come here in verse 25. David made this a statue, an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. You see, God allows us, the Spirit what we do, I believe, to prepare us for what He has for us in the future. And so we don't want to simply lay aside all that, but remember that God still has work for us to do. And He wants us to continually focus on Him and focus on the facts. And I want to read just a passage from Philippians chapter 3. Because I believe that Paul had this same idea in mind when we look at chapter 3 of Philippians and verses 12 to 16. In verse 12, we find this. Not that I have already obtained at all, all of this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and strength toward what is ahead, I press on toward a goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. You see, the road to recovery can start with forgetting the past failures, disappointments, and defeats, and focusing on the future as possibilities. Forgetting all those negative things all those failures, all of that, and then focus on what God has for us in the future, the possibilities. I've shared with some of you, before the school year began, I was informed that I was not going to have two students that were in fifth grade last year. One student has some serious emotional needs, and to give an idea of what it's like, the teacher that had him shared with me that there are times where he gets so frustrated that he can just stop on a dime and just turn from being this happy-go-lucky kid to just this person who just has an outburst and loses control. And other times, when he wants to be calmed down, he would actually rub her hair in, in class. And I'm thinking, it's happened to me, and I rub my hair off. <laughs> But I'm thinking, this kid has some serious emotional needs. How am I going to be able to meet those needs? And I was told he wasn't coming back this year. Another student who was in fifth grade, kept, been kept back already a year, and actually is at a third grade level. And I was told, hey, what about that? I'm going to come back next year. Well, 
school year started. Before our first day, I was informed that this student who is at a third grade level was coming back this year. That I have this young lady in my classroom. And at first, I was a little upset, frustrated. And God gave me two words. Obstacle, opportunity. I said, okay, Lord, I do not understand. It makes no sense to me. I thought the decision made last year for the student not to come back this year. And now they're my class. But Jim, obstacle, opportunity. I said, okay, Lord, I look at this as an opportunity for you to manifest yourself and for you to be glorified. I don't know how, but I choose to not look at this as an obstacle, but an opportunity. Went to school, first day of school. And I was before, by the way, do you know that so and so's back this year? They just saw him sitting in the office. This little boy who has these emotional needs is back after me. So now I have two, along with some others that are challenging in different ways. But God again said, Jim, wait a minute. Obstacle, opportunity. You see, we need to put aside what we think is best, what we see as obstacles, and look at the opportunities, the possibilities that God has for us. And see, it all goes back for me and for David and his men. Focus on the Father. Focus on the facts, the truth of God's Word. And focus on the future. You see, I do not yet know how God is going to work in their hearts. But I will tell you one thing. After three weeks of school, I have already seen God manifest himself and he's being glorified. And I'm thinking... We are beginning week four. We have another 30, 31 weeks left. What is God going to do in that time? You see, I could have just wallowed in my self-pity. and Oh, it's going to be challenging this year, more so than I expected. But you see, even David was able to put what happened to one side and focus on the task of recovering what had been taken from them, focusing on the near future of what God was going to do for them. I trust that whatever it is that we are facing, and I don't know where you are this morning, I don't know what you're struggling with, or what you're going to struggle with, but I can guarantee you, focus on the Father, Focus on the facts, the truth of God's word. Focus on the future and what God is going to do in you and through you and for you and for others for his glory. I want to conclude with something I was given years ago. And once again, it seems I stuck aside, you know, and I'm going to use it someday. And it fits in with this message. And again, it's a little lengthy, but listen to the words. It's entitled, The Church Walking with the World. The church and the world walked far apart on the changing shores of time. The world was singing a giddy song and the church a hymn sublime. Come, give me your hand, cried the merry world, and walk with me this way. But the good church hid her snowy hand and solemnly answered, Nay, I will not give you my hand at all, and I will not walk with you. Your way is a way of endless death. Your words are all untrue. Nay, walk me but a little space, said the world with a kindly air. The road I walk is a pleasant road, and the sun shines always there. Your path is thorny and rough and rude, and mine is broad and plain. My road is paved with flowers and gems, and yours with tears and pain. The sky above me is always blue, no want to toil, I know. The sky above you is always dark, your lot is a lot of woe. My path, you see, is a broad, fair path, and my gate is high and wide. There is room enough for you and for me to travel side by side. Half shyly, 
the church approached the world and gave him her hand of snow. The old world grasped it and walked along, saying in accents low, Your dress is too simple to please my taste. I'll give you pearls to wear, rich velvet and skills and silks for your graceful form. And she heard not the orphans cry, and she drew her beautiful robes aside as the widows went weeping by. The sons of the world, the sons of the church, walk closely hand in heart. And only the master who no thaw could tell the two apart. And I realized I skipped a part here, so I need to go back and continue with where I left off with rich velvet silks for your graceful form and diamonds to deck your hair. The church looked down at her plain white robes and meant the dazzling world and blushed as she saw his handsome lip with a smile contemptuous curled. I will change my dress for costlier one to the church with a smile of grace. Then her pure garments drifted away and the world gave in their place beautiful satins and shining silks and roses and gems and pearls. And over her forehead her bright hair fell, crisp in a thousand curls. Your house is too plain, said the proud old world. I'll build you one like mine. Carpets of Brussels and curtains of lace and furniture ever so fine. So he built her costly and beautiful house, splendid was to behold. Her sons and her beautiful daughters dwelt there, gleaming in purple and gold. And fairs and shows and halls were held, and the world and his children were there. And laughter and music and feasts were heard in the place that was meant for prayer. She had cushioned pews for the rich and the great to sit in their pomp and their pride, while the poor folks, clad in their shabby suits, sat meekly down outside. The angel of mercy flew over the church and whispered, I know thy sin. The church went back with a sigh along to gather her children in. But some were off in the midnight ball, and some were off to play, and some were drinking in gay saloons, so she quietly went her way. The sly world gallant said to her, Your children mean no harm. Mary indulged in innocent sports, so she leaned on his proffered arm, and smiled and chatted and gathered flowers as she walked along with the world, while millions and millions of deathless souls to the horrible pit were hurled. Your preachers are all too old and plain, said the gay old world with a sneer. They frighten my children with dreadful tales, which I like not for them to hear. They talk of brimstone and fire and pain and the horrors of endless night. They talk of a place that should not be mentioned to ears polite. I will send you some of the better stamp, brilliant and gay and fast, who will tell them that people may live as they list and go to heaven at last. The Father is merciful and great and good, tender and true and kind. Do you think he would take one child to heaven and leave the rest behind? So he filled her house with gay divines, gifted and great and learned, and the plain old men that preached the cross were out of the pulpit turned. You give too much to the poor, said the world, far more than you ought to. If the poor need shelter and food and clothes, why not trouble you? Go, take your money and buy rich robes and horses and carriage fine, and pearls and jewels and dainty food and the rarest and costliest wine. My children, they do all such things, and if you and their love would win, you must do as they do and walk in the ways that they are walking in. The church held tightly the strings of her purse and gracefully lowered her head and simpered, I've given too much away. I'll do, sir, as you have said. So the poor returned from her door in scorn, and she heard not the orphans cry, and she drew her beautiful robes aside as the widow went weeping by. The sons of the world and the sons of the church walked closely, hand in heart, and only the master who knoweth all could tell the two apart. Then the church sat down at her ease and said, I am rich and goods increased. I have need of nothing and not to do but to laugh and dance and feast. The sly world heard her and laughed in his sleep and mockingly set aside. The church is fallen, the beautiful church, and her shame is her boast of pride. The angel drew near to the mercy seat and whispered and sighs her name. And the saints, their anthems of rapture hushed and covered their heads with shame. And a voice came down to the hush of heaven from him who sat on the throne. I know thy works and how thou hast said, I am rich and hast not known, that thou art naked and poor and blind and wretched before my face. Therefore, from my presence I cast thee out and blot thy name from its place. May we not be guilty of walking with the world. May God help us and grant us the strength, desire, and ability to focus on the Father, focus on the facts, and focus on the future so that we don't live in defeat and so we can accomplish, so that He can accomplish in us and through us His good and perfect will. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's just the name. We want to reflect Jesus to this world, 
to those living in despair, living in frustration, living in failure, living in defeat. May we not be just like them, but may they see a difference in us as we focus on the Father, focus on the facts, and focus on the future. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this portion of your word. We thank you for the example that we have of David and his men who suffered such a huge loss. And yet, we read how that David focused on you, focused on the facts, the truths that you gave him, and he focused on the future, knowing that you are in control and that you do what you say you will do. And so help us, I pray, to not live like the world is, but help us to live in such a way that they see a difference in us, that they see Jesus in us, that we'll be able to share Jesus with them, that they can go from living in defeat and live in victory and look to you for the possibilities that you have for them in the future. And so we give you thanks, we give you praise in Jesus' name.